Connect Vancouver is a nonprofit organization that depends on support from the community. We connect Vancouverites to each other and connect Vancouver to the world. We strive to be a gathering place that encourages social engagement and inspires conversation about the past, present, and future. Thank you for getting for joining us today and supporting the MLP. I'm very pleased uh, to see so many gathered here this evening for this discussion on self representation and art making. Um, and just before I hand over the mic, uh, I'd like to draw your attention to our new yellow wall over to your uh, right. Um, it marks the entrance way of our next uh, feature exhibition, The Happy Show, which is the result of Simon Stefan Sagmeister's 10 uh, year exploration of happiness, the personal happiness. Uh, it features engaging infographics, uh, video projections, and graphic installations, and also a preview of his upcoming uh, video, The Happy Film, which depicts his attempts uh, to increase happiness through meditation and cognitive therapy and mood altering pharmaceuticals. The exhibition will be two weeks from and um, as a proudly of the exhibition on April 21st, we're hosting a change maker symposium uh, with the Canadian Institute of Advanced Research. Uh, and it's on building hacker communities, and it features, uh, I might pronounce this wrong, but Mike Linking, um, Grant Schellenberg, Al Matansky, and UBC's John Halliwell, and the deadline for registration is April 16th. And we also recently announced two talks with Stephanie Sagmeister while he's uh, here in town on April 23rd, both of which uh, pretty much sold out already. But there is the opening reception for the Happy Show on April 22nd. If you're an MOE member, uh, you'll be receiving your invitation very soon. And if you're not an MOE member, there's still time to become one. Um, the staff at front desk can tell you more about the benefits. And we'll be announcing more uh, Happy Show related events soon for the month of May. Um, happy Hours, Meditation Workshop, and the Family Festival. Um, so I'm going to hand over the mic now. So please join me in welcoming uh, Julia Christensen from the Contemporary Art Society. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Julia Christensen from the Merit Society in Vancouver, and I'm so pleased to welcome everyone to our panel discussion. Um, we are we thank the Museum of Vancouver for generously hosting us this evening, and we are just so pleased to be partnering with Capture Photography Festival this year. This is the first time we've done this partnership to bring this panel discussion to you. The Capture Photography Festival is an annual month-long festival which is dedicated to celebrating local and international photography, and it runs throughout the month of April in many venues across town. Uh, the Contemporary Art Society is a nonprofit society which promotes the appreciation and, un and understanding of contemporary art. We offer our members high-quality monthly program of artist studio visits, artist talks, lectures, private collection tours, and other events like this event tonight. We also have a uh, support the Biennial Emerging Artist Prize, which encourages and supports our local artists. And the uh, entries for the 2016 Emerging Artist Prize will be launched this fall. Um, we operate entirely on our membership dues and donations and are very active volunteer board of directors, one of whom I would like to introduce to you, <coughs> our colleague, Armisha. She is our vice, current vice president, and in addition to being a very hard-working member of our board, she's also an active artist and uh, maintains her busy and productive art practice. Holly's a graduate of, and she will be the moderator for the panel discussion tonight. So Holly's a graduate of Emily Carr. She has a BFA with distinction in photography. Her work uses digital composites and has been exhibited and published in Canada and internationally. Most recently, Holly exhibited a critically acclaimed uh, show, Marie Antoinette series, at our Vancouver's Back Gallery project. And that was part of the inaugural Capture Photography Festival. And in 2013, Holly won an international competition with the New Materials Art Fair in South Beach during the Miami Art Prize in Miami. Holly is also an aspiring art, book, art writer, and she's worked hard to put together our panel discussion tonight. So please join me welcome to Holly Archer. Oh, um. 
that wonderful introduction, Julia. Um, I'd like to briefly introduce you to my sister panelist, Pierre Piotta, um, and Susan Boffin on the right to my left. Unfortunately, Dina Goldstein is not able to be with us here this evening. When I decided to take on the task of forming this panel discussion, I was very passionately inspired to do so. Given the prolific careers of so many men who face male photographers, both capture and the CSB really wanted to focus on women in photography in hopes of highlighting previously untapped ground. Honoring the mandate of the CSB's focus on contemporary art, I knew that I had to focus not just on women as photographers, but women as artists. In order to narrow this down this topic to a reasonable focus, I asked myself, and I ask you, a few important questions to consider. Who are the most internationally renowned women photographers today? How is their work different than their male peers? And what subjects are they focused on? I also wonder, how is this focus different today than from any other era, if different at all? To find my answers, I began searching through my archival of travel photos, sifting through images from various international art fairs, biennales, and exhibitions. Eventually, a pattern emerged, and the focus became clear through works by prominent artists such as Cindy Sherman, Marina Abramovich, Shirin Nishat, Renike Dijkstra, Micheline Thomas, Tracy Hennon, and others. The common thread was a fixation on self-representation. <laughs> to clarify, by self-representation, I do not mean in self-portraiture, at least not exclusively. I simply mean women representing women. Each artist approaches this differently. Some artists use other women to represent themselves, whereas others use themselves to represent all women. Conversely, others prefer to use everyday objects as abstract representations for women. Looking to other Vancouver-based artists whose work reflects these international themes of self-representation, this panel is assembled. Each artist's work in the panel examines key issues that are reflected by our current collective psyche. Discussions in our works include vast related questions, revelations, and protests. They go to 
they go out for coffee, they go to the cinema, they go to the park for, um, for a picnic, and then they have some other luxuries, uh, such as uh, going on a yacht, uh, a private airplane, etc. Uh, Carl's girlfriend sort of has taken what she's seen and what she's learned through the media at face value. As you can tell, she's quite content, she's very happy, uh, and she doesn't sort of, she just accepts that, that with an uncritical surrender uh, to those ideals that happiness is in the form of, of Carl and, and what they have together. Um, at first, you can look at these images and you can, there's a humor element to it, and of course that's designed because we know Carl isn't real. And that's the first layer of me and reading the images. But if you take some time and if you spend a little bit of sort of, if you're interested enough to sort of look at the work, uh, they become psychologically more complex. You can ask questions such as why is she so content? Why is she so happy? Uh, and the, the answer is really, it's open-ended. There's not one answer. There's not one way of reading these images. Also in the titles that you can see, uh, they're driven from her point of view. Uh, what does Carl do for her? So in this image here, you see Carl so thoughtful, what's even my birthday? So Carl is, goes beyond uh, the sense of duty, and he can sort of, you know, he's just very thoughtful, etc. Um, so it's sort of these, these ideas of living this, this fantasy-driven uh, life, and what does that mean, and what, uh, you know, what, what do you get from it? What, does it leave you empty? Does it leave you happy, etc. cetera? Um, I think she's, I mean, look at her and, and I can't say that she's wrong. You know, maybe she, maybe she has something like that. <laughs> Susan, have we as women created an ideal male? Any salary the consequences of this fallacy for both genders? Um, I think illusions is, is a tricky thing. I think it's a slippery slope. Uh, sometimes a dangerous one as well. Um, ideals and perfectionism. What is this ideal that we're striving towards? Does, is there certain criteria? Does, does a person have to look a certain way uh, to, to, you know, for us to be happy? Um, I think idealism is very, very tricky. I think it can sort of uh, rob you of a true sense of our life, you know. Um, if you get sort of caught in in sort of fantasy of, of this all. It's interesting that you're smiling in every photo, and the smile is something that we rarely equate with contemporary art. However, you are very critical. In fact, this is rather cynical work that you've produced. I don't know if it's cynical. Again, it's like I'm not here to judge her. I'm not here to say she's right or wrong. That's up to the viewer. Everyone has a point of view. Everyone, and that's usually sort of dependent on their uh, people's life experiences. Um, is it cynical? I think it's just that what I'm really doing is sort of question starts for I'm not interested in just being like, this is life, this is, you know, this is I'm interested in questioning. So you have to look at you have to look at the work and you have to think, what is really going on here? Is she blinded by her love? Is this is this authentic? Is she just overwhelmed by emotions and she just she thinks she's you know, the luckiest woman alive, is, is it something else? Does she look at him and realize, oh, really, there's something quite not right, he's kind of not real, but you know what, everything else is wonderful. And maybe she excuses that one sort of flaw in him. You know, it's kind of difficult to say. Susan, I recognize a lot of these settings. Can you tell me why you chose, you chose Yale Town as the backdrop for many of these shots? Um, Yale Town was used in quite a few of these images. This is an image uh, in Yale Town. <laughs> And one of the reasons why is because I wanted a contemporary setting. I wanted these images to uh, to be very clean, to be very modern, to be very um, no clutter, just to be very today. And Yale Town was a, a good landscape for that. Um, but you know, in this industry, I did other. I took um, these images in different places. Uh, I asked friends, and the other images that were shot in um, my friend, my friends from the Shaughnessy. But wherever I, I photographed, I wanted the aesthetic to be very, um, just very pristine, almost like what you would see in the last magazine. That there's no, there's no uh, room for wrinkles or uh, you know imperfections here, and that's done intentionally because those are 
the sort of messages that we are getting on a daily basis, like all the time, that, that the look of happiness, and that there is a particular look, and there, you know? And so, yeah, it's not sort of seeing like a, a good location for the You also produced an extended version of the dating portfolio of Playing House. How is this different from the original version? Uh, it, it's an extension of uh, dating portfolio is the first 15 images, and then the dating portfolio of Playing House is the next 15 images. And basically, it's a continuation of a love story, much like any real human love story. They go through a dating phase, they do, you know, the sort of the restaurant, the, the movie, the, you know, all those sort of things. And then it becomes more domesticized in the second part. They're cooking together. He's at the cliffhanger of the first part. Uh, he asks her, you know, um, <coughs> and so there they are together. They move in together. Uh, and then, so what happens next is that they meet each other's families. Uh, so it's a, it's a developing, of a development of their uh, union, it's a strengthening of their bond, and so I wanted to show images that reflected that. I appreciate that the work is very approachable. It reveals the matter taboo issues of women experience using devices such as glamour and humor, not a non hit TV series Sex and the City. Mm-hmm. In fact, your character reminds me of Charlotte, who is always seeking this perfect Park Avenue husband and apartment, and when she got what she wanted, she found she didn't really want what she got. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. It's quite funny. Well, I think humor is sort of like an underused, um, what's the word, like, it's a strategy in, in contemporary art. It's not really used a lot, but I think it's a, it's a way that people can enter the work freely. Um, I really like using humor if I can in my work. Um, and the other thing that you're saying is, like, sometimes you do get what you want. I mean, sometimes it really does happen, and sometimes those expectations and those desires that we have it's not exactly So it's kind of being um, not too careful, but just to sort of question, you know, like even our desires, our wishes, and you know, why do we want certain things? Is it purely because we truly feel that we need these things in our lives to be happy? Or is it because we're sort of being influenced constantly through daily messages, through magazines, through the internet, through just signs everywhere that our happiness is defined in a certain way? And so it just it's just about sort of questioning that a little bit. So maybe, like a Charlotte, you won't be disappointed when you actually do get that whatever you're seeking. I find the charming image of this piece to be particularly loaded. Um, Carl's girlfriend seems so happy to be meeting his family and making a positive impression on them. But little does she seem aware of the implications that come with um, creating that partnership with someone. Um, First, they want to see that you're the right fit for their son. Then they want you to, to get engaged. Then they want you to get married and then to have children. And the pressure to appease these uh, expectations is never really satisfied. And while you're making parts, there are also consequences, <coughs> such as caring not only for your own children, should they enter the equation, but also caring for the sick and the elderly potentially on either side of the family, um, a role that's often relegated to the woman of the house. Um, I recently read an article in Forbes magazine that states that it's being one of the number one reasons why there are so few women at the top of the world of that. It's difficult to know in if she's thinking all those things or if she's just having you know, dinner with his family. Um. <laughs>
three out of four of us had close family members entered the hospitals and had remained in critical or palliative care. Two days ago, Dean Goldstein's father passed away, and unfortunately that's why she's not here with us this evening. Um, although she can't be here, we would still like to honor her and her family this evening by discussing her work. Dean Goldstein is represented by Madison Gallery in the Bay, California, Richard Goodall Gallery in Manchester, UK, Galleria Bianca Marie Rizzi in Milan. She has also worked with Bush Lamoa Gallery in Vancouver, Art Muir in Montreal, Gallery Acto in Paris, and during the inaugural Capture Photography Festival, we were fortunate to have a work exhibit here again in Vancouver at Kimoto Gallery. In 2007, Dean's work took on a very different tone. Rather than simply taking photos, she began creating her photos. Her subject matter turned away from real people, men and women alike, to exclusively exploring the generic social construct of women through the use of mythological figures. It was apparent that there was something transpiring in Dina's personal and professional life at that time that was the impetus behind this major shift in her work that resulted in the Golden Princesses series. Dina writes, the project was inspired by my observation of three-year-old girls who had an interest in Disney's fairy tales. As a new mother, I have been able to get a close-up look at the phenomenon of young girls fascinated with princesses and the desire to dress up like them. The Disney version almost always has a sad beginning with an overbearing female villain, and the end is a predictably happy one. The prince usually saves the day and makes the victimized young baby into a princess. Dean's backstory of this particular image is that after marrying the prince, um, the Cinderella finds out that she is infertile. After se several failed in vitro fertilizations, she realizes that she might never conceive and turns to alcohol to console herself. <laughs> According to Dina, as a young girl growing up abroad, she was not exposed to fairy tales. So, upon discovering them as a mother, she became fascinated with their origins. She explored the original mother's dream stories and found that they had some very dark and sometimes gruesome aspects, many of which were being interpreted by Disney. She began to imagine Disney's perfect princesses juxtaposed with real life issues that were affecting women around her, such as illness, addiction, and self image issues. With limited funds and a lot of determination, Dina began to assemble the Fallen Princesses series. First, she had to find the right models who could portray these characters with depth and emotion. Volunteers and skilled artists were recruited to help shoot Cinderella in a dive bar on Vancouver's in infamous Hastings Street, and Snow White in a domestic nightmare surrounded by unkempt children with a lazy butterfly prince in the background. She told me about motherhood and doing this particular shoot. Um, I use a lot of digital imaging in my work, and I assumed that there was photocompsy going on here. However, um, Dean was eight or nine months pregnant with her second daughter as she stood in heat and stench at the landfill in Delta. This is her remaking of the Princess and the Pea atop the countless mattresses that are disposed of every day, reflecting an era of mass pollution. We visited Dina's studio recently and um, talked to her about some of her work. I believe this is uh, Pocahontas, who uh, her love never came to her, so she fell prey to depression. Agoraphobia keeps her inside watching TV with only cats for companionship. Rapunzel sits in a hospital room with cancer. Her beautiful long hair, now in the form of a wig, following extensive chemotherapy. Dina once told the Huffington Post that around the same time that her daughter Jordan was born, and sorry, and was getting into Disney princesses, 
Her own mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. Tina's rage against the Disney motif inspired this series, and she began to wonder what would happen if the princesses had to battle the disease, struggle financially, or deal with aging. Sleeping Beauty's prince never left her side and remains with her in old age, waiting for her to come out of this coma